My name is Evan Meyer, and you're listening to the Undomesticate Podcast, a show where we explore how to deprogram domestication, restore the health of our body, mind, and spirit, and return to our sovereign roots. It's round two of uh, our conversations together, except for this time we're coming from beautiful island of the Pacific Northwest up here in Washington. Gorgeous day, sitting on the ocean. You might be able to hear it in the background slightly if you're listening to this or watching this. And uh, I have Nick Warner. We're uh, spending a lot of time together lately. We were just in Austin last week with a bunch of beautiful humans i recorded a podcast with our good friend alan and we're here in washington for a few days before we head down to mount shasta to finish up the, this year's teacher training program with john john wineland with a bunch of beautiful souls and yeah we we wanted to sit down and record this because last time we had some technical difficulties we got the recording but the video kind of cut off so i think we figured that out and uh let's start again uh, just by maybe introducing yourself who you are you know, what, you, what you've been up to lately, what you do, and, and how you work with people. Thanks, mate. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, for those of you that cannot see where we are, we're in a treehouse uh, 20 meters above the ocean. Paradise, I would say, mate. Mm-hmm. We sat out here the other day and just cooking some steaks, playing some music. It's just really feeling the proper nourishment of being in nature with brotherhood. It's just like something that I never really gave importance to until the last few years. So I appreciate the invitation and the fact. Um, So my journey started probably seven years ago. Life fell apart, married, working as an architect, hit rock bottom and spent three and a half years full-time traveling, trying to heal, trying to get to the bottom of everything that I'd kind of carried with me for most of my life. And in the process of that, discovering that I had no purpose. And towards the end of that journey, realizing that my purpose was to actually allow to create space for men to realize the truth of their heart and to actually find the courage to follow it. And that has been an experiment, I would say, that I've been on for the last seven years and it has has afforded me a life that I would have once only dreamed of. And yeah, I spend my days traveling the world, running retreats, workshops, hanging out in beautiful locations with you know, amazing men and humans and and have a very, very beautiful life because of it. Hmm. Yeah, one thing we were talking about before, you know, we hit record was this idea of rites of passage and how so many of us, most of us, I would say, especially in, in the Western world, but I would even say universally, don't really have those initiatory experiences and I'm curious like in the last seven years what were some of the initiations or the rites of passage that maybe you stumbled upon didn't know was a rite of passage at the time or something that you did perhaps it was intentional but what was it that started to because I I think rites of passage and purpose are kind of they go hand in hand right like you go through these initiations in life these these passages and then perhaps your purpose shifts or your purpose becomes more clear. You become more aligned with like the core essence of who you are and what you're here to give the world. And for, for us, you know, it's, we're fortunate it happened as young as we are, but we're also pretty, we're we're quite a bit older to, to step into this stuff. When you think in the grand scheme of, you know, how things used to go back in, in antiquated cultures and, you know, indigenous cultures where you really would go through these when you're young, like 14, 15, 16, whatever, and that really is when you began to solidify your place in the world and, and had an identity and a relationship with your community in a way that you started to give back. You weren't just receiving and growing up. 
So I guess I'm curious, like over the last seven years, what, what have been the rites of passage that you've gone through, whether intentionally or unintentionally, uh, that kind of led you to where you are right now? Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful question. And I want to just take a step back just to kind of explain the, how crucial it is because I was, you know, when I was 10, I was like, okay, when I'm 20, I'm going to have all my shit worked out. Mm-hmm. And then I got to 20, I was like, ah, oh, when I'm 30, I'll have all my shit worked out. And then I got to 30 and I'm like, fucking hell, I still don't even feel like a man. And it wasn't until end 30s where I actually had been on this journey for a while and then it real, really allowed myself to enter into these processes where I could stake in the ground claim like, fuck, now I actually feel like a man. And the problem that we have in the West is that there really, there are very, very few cultures where rites of passage or initiation happens for boys into manhood. So what happens is that you have a bunch of boys running around looking for this chance to prove themselves now a man and they look to other guys in the same position. So, you know, maybe if I fuck a bunch of women or if I get wasted or if I drive fast cars or if I get into fights and all of these really shallow, immature boyhood ways of thinking that this is going to make them more of a man, this is the society we live in. We have a bunch of men running around psychologically still stuck in the immature boy uh, they never grew out of. Traditionally, in most other cultures, there would be a period where a group of men, typically the uncle and the mentors and the, and the friends of the father would come and then take the boy away from the mother and then put him through an experience where he was removed from society. He goes through an ordeal and then he is integrated back into society as a different human. Um, kind of metaphorically speaking, the boy is killed so the man can rise up. And... This was the issue that I'd found in my own life was that I didn't have that. And I was running around chasing my own tail, kind of trying to figure out what would make me a man rather than have somebody guide me through that or lead me through that. So the first things I did were not, this is what I want to do and this is going to be the initiation, but I just stumbled across different forms of plant medicine that were traditionally used or typically used as an initiation for boys in that culture. And the main one that is an initiation is with a, um, it's with a plant from, from Gabon called Iboga. And it is, it's a five day initiation process where you eat the root of this plant and you have this experience that is incredibly uncomfortable and an incredibly difficult experience and it it is called an initiation because they give it to boys when they're 12 and there is this kind of idea that the boy is removed from society and he's put through this ordeal and then he comes back and everybody now treats him differently the next thing i did which i really kind of was like okay this is something that I would consider a rite of passage for myself was a vision quest. So went and sat in a mountain for four days, four nights, no food, no water. And it is a traditional form of uh, rite of passage for Native American cultures. And the idea is that you again are removed from society and you are separated and you have this ordeal and whatever comes up for you over the course of those four days is kind of it allows you to define the trajectory of where you want to go in life and you know David Data speaks of the idea if you don't know what your purpose is you go and sit somewhere for as long as it takes until you can feel the urgency or the desire of as soon as I get out this is what I'm going to do and for me, that really, that was really true. Uh, you know, for three of the four days, I had this idea of like, this is the fucking thing. This is, I have to get off the mountain and do this thing. What was it? What was the thing? Well, <laughs> it was create a video course. Hmm. On what? 
it was to create so i'd had this idea since 2019 i'm going to create this video course on mastering your sexuality mm. so you're already on the sexual kind of healing path or the tantric path at that point exactly so mm -hmm. 2016 i started that 2019 i started to have people say oh can you teach me this stuff and i was like oh I'll just i'll create a course but as i developed and as i learned more and as i continually did my own kind of learning this thing just became so big that i just it was like looking at a mountain and going fuck it I'm, i'll shelve it and then i sat literally sat on the mountain and for three days out of the four days, this was the thing. They're like, it just would not leave me alone. And you know, everybody else, they have visions of jaguars and fucking snakes and eagles. And I'm sitting there thinking about this video course. And I'm like, <laughs> this can't be it. Like, this has got to be something else. Fast forward three years and the moment that I actually gave myself to do that video course to create the thing, my entire life changed, my entire business changed, everything. Since I did that thing that came to me on the mountain two and a half years ago, my entire life has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and it was such a transformative experience, but I still, there was a part of me that still didn't feel like I could call myself a man. So then last year with a couple of other mates, we went and did something called Sundance and it scared, it scared me more than anything I've ever contemplated in my life. And Before you did it or while doing it? Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was something that I knew of, it was something that I'd heard of and it was just something that was so far beyond my edge that I just, I didn't even consider it. And then a series of synchronicities happened. I was invited to one a few months later. And I realized that actually this was the exact thing that I needed to do. And for, for those not familiar with the Sundance, do you mind just giving a quick synopsis of like what it is, how, how it works, and maybe where it comes from and all that, if you know? So again, it's a kind of a Native American culture uh, or tradition. And you have this tree of life in the middle of this quite expansive yard or area mm -hmm. and everybody you make these little prayers you make 365 prayers which are filled with tobacco and some other herbs and when i did it the first time there were 90 people dancing so there was 90 times 365 prayers wrapped around this tree wow and the greatest the most beautiful thing about this entire experience is that it's a prayer. And even if you don't believe in prayer, you can't not. When you go to this and you experience the magic of what exists and what occurs, you can't deny it. Mm -hmm. And so you wake up first day, you do a sweat lodge. So you, you're crammed in this in this you know, Temescal sweat lodge, a nipi, depending on what you want to call it. We had 40 to 50 men crammed in this thing and like, you know, fucking fat, sweaty men. And you just, it's like 4.30 in the morning. And, and this goes for about 20 minutes. And then you get up and over the course of the day from sunrise to sunset, you dance in seven rounds. So a round might go for 30 minutes, it might go for an hour and a half. But you dance around this tree of life that's in the middle. And there's eight guys just pounding on this drum and the women behind them and everybody's singing and it's quite an incredible feeling and once the sun starts to go down then you do another sweat lodge and then you go to bed and you wake up at sunrise sweat lodge dance all day sweat lodge do this for four days and you're fasted right during this whole experience no food no water no food and no water so you're dry fasting yeah. and you do this in portugal yeah in the middle of summer it was fucking 33 degrees. Temescal, so, so you're sweating like crazy. The, you know, the, for anyone that's never done a sweat lodge, it's imagine like going into a steam room, right? Because they pour water on these rocks and then just cranking it up to 11, right? It's so <laughs> hot and it just gets hotter and hotter and it's crowded and you're kind of in the dirt and you come out and you're drenched and there's stuff stuck to you. And it's a, it's a, 
in the same thing you're you're in you're in sweat and you're in lodge to prayer right it's it's all about the prayer these things are all about the prayer i haven't done this the the sun dance but i've supported the moon dance which is kind of the reciprocal you know the feminine version happens at night but to the idea you know i've 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 done 3 days dry fasted and that's just like laying around hanging out going for little walks but to dance to sweat twice a day with no water in the sun from sunrise to sunset that is the idea of that is terrifying and that was that was my entire process yeah. like how can you not die exactly that's the one like, <laughs> oh, you're definitely dying like you're definitely someone dies i'm sure like you know what i mean like <laughs> and i was just like well this is i mean first of all i was like why would you do that yeah like what is the point and then i met guys who had done it so the other piece of it is at some point you give a skin offering or a blood offering. So you put two pegs through your chest and you, you attach these pegs to the tree and then you kind of lean back and the rope gets tight and then at some point you jump back and you rip these pegs out of your chest. And I'm just like, why the fuck would anybody want to do that? Mm-hmm. And then I'd speak to these guys and they're covered in scars. I'm like, man, you kept doing it. And they're like, yeah. You do it once and you realize, like, once you go beyond the ideas and the belief systems of the mind that say that that's not possible, you tap into a different part of yourself that you might not ever access because you're constantly distracting yourself with phone and books and women and fucking whatever it is. So by day two, guys were fucked. Guys were like, they could barely stand up. And the idea, you know, it was 33 degrees, which I don't know what it is, 90 or fucking... It's in the 90s, yeah, yeah, Fahrenheit, yeah. Um, And you're in the sun and you're just sweating. And then you're dancing. And you just, (laughs) the sun is beaming down and you just, and there's guys ripping pieces of the skin out and you just, there's a a party and you're just like, what the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. But the... The moment for me came, it was day four. Guys were literally dropping to the ground, like exhausted, dehydrated, fucking sunstroke. And there was a story in my mind that was saying, you're tired, you're thirsty, you need to stop, you need rest, you need all of these things. Poor me, what am I doing? Mm. And I was really sluggish at this point. And I'm thinking, hang on a second, this music, you hear this music basically 24 hours a day and it is literally drummed into your DNA and it gives you so much fucking strength and so much power. The sun gives us power. The sun gives us strength. So I'm sitting there, I'm standing there trying to dance and like all the story in my mind. I'm saying, hang on a second, what if I just stopped listening to that story? Because the music is giving me strength and the sun is giving me strength. And what if I just stopped listening to the fucking poor woe is me version and I actually just embraced being here? And suddenly I went from like a 1 out of 10 with energy to like a fucking 12. And I was just like, it was a complete mindset shift. And that was the thing for me that changed everything. And the moment this thing finished, I just stood there and fucking wept because I realized that there was nothing in my life that scared me more than anything except for that or until that. Mm. And I did it and I crushed it. And it was just like, there is nothing I cannot do. And that was the moment in my life where I realized that fucking now I'm a man. Yeah. And it was just this, this overwhelming sense of, accomplishment and it was a spiritual it was a spiritual awakening in in a sense of like i needed to get out of my body to be able to really accomplish this and to really get through it and do it yeah and and it's not over right that's a four-year commitment once you do, once so, you do one you're you're in for four years that's the commitment so i go back in like three weeks and do it oh, again like, how are you feeling about it this year <laughs> I was super excited and then a few weeks ago I ran into a mate that I did it with and we started talking about it and then it started to sink in of like, fuck, really? 
doing mm-hmm. it again. Um, <laughs> it's funny how things like that are, you know, you, it's brutal during it. And then after you kind of reflect on experiences like that with a lot of gratitude and, and nostalgia and joy. And then, but to do it again, it's like this morning we sat with combo, right? And I hadn't sat with that, that medicine in years. And I remember like, Oh no, it was great. Like it was been like five or six years. And I was like, no, it's good. It's cleansing. I felt amazing after. And then as soon as you put it on within like 15 seconds, I was like, what the fuck did I just do? Oh, and I just, you know, the head's ringing, the tinnitus is going, my heart's just pounding. And I'm like, I might die. I think, I don't know. I might, I might die. And then of course, you know, you go through the whole purge and the process and it feels like someone's giving your guts, just wringing it out like a towel. And then after I get it all out, I'm collapsed there in, in bliss and just zoned out. I'm like, oh, so bad. I could do that again. But then I know that if I were to do it again, I would go through the same fucking process. I'd be like, fuck, why did I do this? It happens every time. Every time I sit in a plant medicine ceremony, it's like, ah, oh, fu- I did too much. Fuck, why did I do this? What am I doing here? Right. And those, that's part of, I think that's part of like getting, you know, circling back to that piece around these rites of passage or these initiations. It's often so uncomfortable and so confronting. And usually for me, there's some essence of I might die in this, which which there is a death, right? I think that's part of it is there's something does have to give and, and maybe it's not your physical form and you're not ready to leave the earth yet, but something in you does die. Even this morning, like I felt through that purge, like something did die in me, right? Um, yet we continue to go back to these things because there's something deeper calling us into these experiences. And I think that's what so many men are feeling and yearning for is like there has to be this deeper confrontation with life and death that brings us alive you know that brings us back into life and because we don't have that in the west it has been replaced as you said with status and money and fast cars and women and and it's like this hungry ghost to just trying to consume something to feel alive because we've never had those initiatory, those rites of passage experiences. And the other piece of that is that we live lives of quiet desperation and depletion and we numb ourselves with drinks and drugs and porn and all of this shit Mm -hmm. that if we don't have these peak experiences that push us to the fucking edge, then we don't feel it. So that's why you see so many men. It's like, okay, what's next? What's next? And this was, for me, this was it in the beginning. Like, this was why I started doing this shit because I couldn't fucking feel anything. Mm -hmm. I couldn't feel happiness. I couldn't feel joy. I couldn't feel pain. So it was like, what's the thing that is going to push me so far to my fucking edge that I might break? And then that was the beginning of my journey. And that was, it was like, oh, fuck, okay, I've done that. So what's next? And... It's far less of that now because I feel a lot and I feel easily. Um, but this is just one of those things. I had this moment during the Sundance was like, if I want to lead men like I do, I need to do things that I fucking wouldn't normally. And I need to push myself to a place where I actually can stand solidly with myself and say, I can do this. Mm-hmm. I can. I have the fucking capacity, and I have the experience, and I have the. I have the courage to be able to do things, which maybe I never would have done, and which will allow me to lead men in a way that I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, Al and I were were talking about that last week uh, because of you know the journey he went on with the fasting and everything like that, um, about how like we need these specific containers in order to have these experiences. We can't have them haphazardly. I can't hook myself up to a tree here and dance around it for four days. You know what I mean? It's not like something we can take on ourselves. We have to literally seek out these curated experiences because it's within that container that we can touch the very fabric, like the edge of what is possible and still be held in it. Right. And so many men live so fast and so loose that they're doing these. It, it, there's no there's no shortage of risk taking, 
But it's when it's not coming with an intention and with a, a beginning and an end and, and a proper container, it's useless, right? And so finding these leaders, these people, these um, old ways of, uh, you know, traditional ways of being that introduce us to something sacred, right? Mm-hmm. That we can really touch on our mortality mm-hmm. and on what it means to be human and mm-hmm. what's possible. If you never do that, you're a boy forever. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're, you're permanently a boy. You look at people out there that, but it doesn't matter how much money or success they've attained or how much they own or how many women they fucked. You can just, you sense the boyishness of it all, right? Just the immaturity of it all. This is a, uh I had this thought the other day that I used to look up to these men with the women and the cars and the money and the status and all this shit. And I used to look, oh, that's what I want to get to. And now they're all my clients <laughs> because they're all fucking depressed and anxious and their life's a mess. And maybe they have all of these things, but they're super fucking unhappy and they're ungrounded. And you can just feel when you speak to them, it's like, whoa, man, you, you occur as unsafe to be around. Because you are so loose and so leaky and so ungrounded. So it's, um, and this is the issue in society is that we have role models like fucking Andrew Tate. Because there's no, boys and young men don't have anybody else to look up to. So that suddenly they see somebody who speaks to their pain, who says, yes, I see where you're coming from. I see the fucking problems that you, you guys have. Even to a lesser extent, Jordan Peterson, one of the reasons he's so popular with young men is because he acknowledges... He gets them. He yeah. fucking gets them. And mm-hmm. for, you know, we live in a society where masculinity generally gets shat on because people feel unsafe. It's not just fucking women. Like, men feel unsafe to be around men. The patriarchy isn't all men. It's a fucking group of elite men that have created this kind of society that we're living in but for many men it feels like men get blamed so suddenly they can't they have nobody to turn to and then you get somebody like Andrew Tate who's like this is how it is I see where you're at this is what is feels good looks good whatever and people like oh I want that yeah yeah the interesting thing about him is like he is addressing people in a way that does speak to them but then the solution he provides is not that terrible it's not deep right yeah. it's, just, it's actually just perpetuates the problem yeah. because all those people you go through whatever his programs and everything and say you do find success following in his footsteps you get to the top and you realize like oh this isn't it either yeah. right it's just like i said it's that hunger ghost you're just trying to fill a void but the the question to answer is why is the void there in the first place yeah. right because it's not it's not society's fault like you know oh, like we're not victims of society blaming us and any of these dudes that talk about men's rights and you know like upholding the patriarchy or whatever it's 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 just as boyish right it's just a reactionary they're just reaction they're reacting to the reactivity and it's it's just an endless loop of bullshit with no depth involved and yeah of course people are going to gravitate towards guys like andrew tate because he speaks truths but then he speaks a bunch of bullshit and then like like i said the solution he provides is just perpetuating the problem and jordan peterson i think speaks from a more grounded and kind of um, reasonable place, but still making enemies, right? This and that, either or context, like, you know, pointing the finger back at people, none of which is a solution because in my opinion, a man that has, and I'm still going through this process and still learning and still unwinding the parts of me that are a little fucking boy, you know what I mean? And, and having to seek out other cultures and other people and other leaders in order to go through these initiatory experiences in order to go through rites of passage. Um, but knowing that when I, there is a place that I've felt in other men and that I've gotten to myself where like there is no chip on my shoulder. There is no one to blame for the way the world is. There's no, there's no self-deprecation around being a man, nor do I blame the patriarchy, nor do I blame feminists, nor do you know what I mean? It's when we start to take 100% responsibility for just our life and, and what we can control and accept that things are the way they are. But that only happens when you take things to the edge and you realize like, oh, like I can go from a two to a 12 in my energy right now, even though I'm fucking starving, even though I have heat stroke, even though I'm like, I don't want to be here, that you have 
you have the conviction and you have the power. And like you said, you have the courage and the autonomy to choose, right? And to, to decide to be the main character of your life and not at the effect of the world and what mm. everyone else is thinking mm. and then grasping on to dudes like Tate because he just becomes daddy to a bunch of boys. That's what it is. You know what I mean? It's like same with Jordan Peterson. It's like the stern father that tells you to clean your room. That's great. And I love some of those things that he's sharing. But ultimately, like you're just projecting your fucking father wound on all these people because you never became a man. You're still looking for dad everywhere in the world. Exactly. Oh. Yeah, there's... um. One of the most horrifying yet liberating insights I ever had was the fact that I'm 100% responsible for my entire life mm. because what that means is nobody's going to come save you. And so many people are just waiting for the dad or for the mom or for the partner or for the fucking whoever it is to come and save them from the pittance of their life. The life that you have created, the life that you have is a, a life that you created through decision making or lack of decision making or shitty choices or lack of responsibility. You are 100% responsible for it. And once you take that ownership, once you've really fucking allow that to land, you empower yourself. Because if you created a life that you hate, then you can create a life that you love. And this is the exact fucking journey I've been on. Like... I was suicidal. I was lying in bed having nightmares, waking up sweating and fucking crying. And I was like, I can kill myself because that's the easy option. Or I can actually figure out how to shift where I'm at. And that was the moment where I started to take responsibility. And then I live, I f I live a fucking dream life. And it's, it's because of the fact that I faced that idea that I was the one that created the life that I didn't like I was the one yes my marriage sucked but it was my fault mm -hmm. once I took responsibility for all of it even for the fact my wife having an affair I played the victim for fucking years and it's easy at some point it's, it's like yeah hang on a second but what if I created that what if I chose that and I'm a firm believer that everything that happens we choose on a soul level like we choose this thing to happen we choose this trauma we choose this accident we choose this thing because within that pain is the medicine and then we take that medicine it becomes a purpose and then suddenly we have meaning in life and then suddenly life changes and then suddenly when you're fully in alignment with your purpose and your fucking higher calling then life is beautiful yeah that's a really powerful statement that so often that I've experienced in my own life and, you know, talking with men like you and just meeting dudes that are creating powerful change or impact in the world and whatever avenue that they select often, almost a hundred percent of the time, if it's coming from a real deep place and a real, real aligned place, it came from having to take responsibility for something in their life that was fucked up. Mm. Right. And, that's the it's it's the only way to approach life from a place where you'll be fulfilled or satisfied or content at all because if you don't take responsibility for everything in your world including the things that you might not like you might have been a, a legitimate victim of something you still have to take responsibility for it because without that you're always at the will of that effect. You'll mm -hmm. always carry that story with you and you get to choose if that story is the one that empowered you and caused you to change your whole life and you know find your purpose and start doing the things that you always wanted to do or becoming who you really know you're capable of being or if you let that story hold you back forever. We know people, mm -hmm. right? They're in a story, they're caught in a story and they're gonna let that story keep them in the perpetual loop of not being able to take action on what they want or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Not living the life that they want because that story runs the whole show, mm. right? And it's like, so fucking what? It's like, yeah, of course, acknowledge it, be with it, feel it fully, you know, reconcile what you need to in your life, but then what? Then you have to let it go and you have to move on. Then you have to start to see how can I use this as the medicine to launch me into the next initiation, the next transformation in my life? Because in my opinion, I use the, the word in initiation quite loosely as like we're constantly being initiated by life, right? Relationship breakdown, affairs, whatever, addictions, 
loss of job, trauma, car accidents. It doesn't matter. Job losses, whatever, whatever your path is, is like these. If you choose to relate to it in a way where you're like, okay, what is life trying to show me? You know, and how can I take responsible responsibility to take what's happening to me and use it to happen for me in order for me to accelerate my life? Exactly. It's that mind f- mindset switch of why is this happening to me to why is this happening for me mm-hmm. and if you can yeah there are people who s- suffer horrific trauma and it is not their fault i get that but the healing is their responsibility and as you said if you continually just fucking stay in the story of poor me woe is me you are never going to change your life is never going to get better but it's the moment that you fucking empower yourself i had this I have this qu- this you know, favorite question that I ask people, and it's if you could take one memory from this life into the next life, what would it be? And often you get these incredibly beautiful responses. And this one moment, I asked this woman that question, and she said, "The moment I was raped." And I was like, "Jesus!" And she said, "That was the moment my entire life changed." Because I went from living a certain way to realizing that actually I'm in control of what happens now. And her entire life shifted to living this fucking incredible life, writing books, creating a business, all based on what had happened to her. But instead of continually playing the victim to what happened, she actually used it to create this dream life for herself. And that's it's just the epitome of going from victim to being the author of your own story. And it was a really fucking profound moment for me because I was still at that point of like, oh, poor me, my wife had an affair. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and I imagine like just people hearing or hearing that, it's probably pretty hard to wrestle with. Like something, this person was legitimately victimized, victimized which is totally acceptable and there, there is a period of of course we can never step over these things we have to grieve we have to feel fully we have to create you know uh healing and time to to dive into these wounds and like really come from an empowered place we can't just step over them or bypass but at some point that story will run the rest of your life the way it is because it's never going to change there's no Nothing ever changes by just relating to something the same way. We relate to our life the same way over and over and over again and accept things to change or expect things to change. But at the end of the day, at some point, we just have to draw the line and say, okay, I'm going to relate to this in a way that best serves me so I can. And she's probably serving so many people by changing the context of that story for herself, right? She can probably get and understand and serve so many more people than if she were to stay in the safe place of being victimized. Mm. It reminds me of this concept I heard once about your capacity to change the past. And when I heard it, I'm like, fucking, how does that work? Say you have an experience. It's an experience. It's not positive or negative. It's just an experience. And then we use our own judgments and our our own history and patterns to kind of pass judgment on that experience. So say something happens to you and you consider it a negative experience at the time. As time goes on, if you reframe that experience to be something different to how you did in the beginning, you can quite literally change the past. Because suddenly you go from, oh my God, poor me, I'm I'm such a victim of this, to, wow, this thing happened to me, and it was the greatest thing that ever happened. And suddenly just that mindset shift offers offers you the opportunity to change history and to change what has happened yeah i know for me like in my late teens i got really into drugs i dropped out of high school ended up overdosing a couple times and i left after the second time i left the uh the hospital i was there for four days under observation i was rushed into the er i was okay but they kept me there and i when i left the hospital i had this like crippling anxiety and like crippling like i couldn't fucking leave my house like without having a panic attack i was just my fucking heart was pounding all the time i was sweating i was just miserable right and i struggled with that for fucking years after and i was like this fucking sucks like (laughs) fuck me like what why did this happen why did i do this to myself you know what i mean but that was what got me on my healing journey Mm -hmm. 
because I was 19, I was 18 and the doctor's like, oh, you know, here, antidepressants, you can take these. And then you know, where does that end? Right. Do I just fucking take these forever? And I knew that whatever intuitively I was like, no, this is not what I want to do. It took me three weeks. I was like, I feel like fucking shit. I'm going to figure this out on my own. I got myself here. I fucked my brain up this way. I'm, well, I wasn't like this before. So I'm going to get back. And so it got me on a healing journey. I, I remember I ordered my first like personal development. It was a, it was a set of CDs. It was, it was like, you know, back in the early 2000s, um, these discs and a book. And it was about healing anxiety. And it talked about meditation. And it had you meditate. And you listen to these tapes and meditate. And it talked about diet. And it talked about um, all type like stimulants and caffeine and all these things that I hadn't really considered before. And I was young, 18, right? And then I started meditating. And then I started seeing results when I changed my diet. And I was like, oh, fuck, this has an impact. Like food has an impact. You know, um, silencing my mind has an impact. When I go to bed has an impact and all this stuff. And it slowly started to just be a catalyst for, okay, now I'm going to start doing yoga. And, then da, 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 da. and like, it went on and on and on. And then, you know, five, six years later, I'm just on this like fucking path of just wanting to grow because I had gotten a taste of it super young but I had to go through that I had to get to this place where I was so fucking miserable in my body that like something had to shift and now when I reflect on it I was like oh that was the best I'm so glad that I did all that shit I'm so glad I dropped out of school I'm so glad that I took too much ecstasy I'm so glad that I hung up with a bunch of fucking shitty punks who didn't give a fuck about their health and so, some of them have died now and I'm so glad that I got out of that world too but I wouldn't have had any of that or maybe it would have had to come when I was 35 after I'd built a life and a career and a family and stuff before I realized my life was a fucking mess I'm so glad that I realized that when I was young mm. right and so these moments I, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this or watching this can reflect on something that was just absolutely devastating at the time. And maybe they're still in it now. Maybe it just happened. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. But always when you get a bit of altitude and when you take a little bit of time away from it, you realize that, oh, fuck, thank God. Thank God my wife had an affair, right? Thank God fucking, like literally thank God. Thank you. Because these are the moments that catalyze our next initiation. These are initiations. Mm -hmm. It's the next evolution, mm -hmm. right? And it's unfortunate that oftentimes so many of us have to get to these rock bottom places. And I think that is partially because we're not going through these rites of passage. Mm -hmm. So we have to go and fuck our life up and fuck our body up and fuck ourselves up and do shit that we sell our soul for money and all these kind of things that we do in order to find some semblance of meaning in it all. Yeah, beautifully said. And there's a, there's a piece around... So I'll go back to what we said at the beginning about men not trusting men. And for a lot of guys that are, probably for most guys that I know, at some point in their life, they start to lose their good male friends and they start to hang out more with women. And they do this often because they don't feel comfortable enough to be open with men or to share vulnerably with men. It's just easier to be around women. But what happens is that you lose the... the sharp reflection that you get when you're around good men. So then you go through life and you don't have these good men in your life and you're like, well, if I don't do this by myself, if I can't handle this, if I can't take care of this, I'm going to appear less masculine. So suddenly you get yourself into a spot where you're fucked and you have no way out because you have to do it by yourself and you don't know anybody else that you can't share it with anybody because – Fuck, what, if, what are they going to think of you if you, you know, tell them that you've got these issues in life? I couldn't share with anybody that my wife had an affair. I told one mate, he took me down to the pub, he got me wasted. It was like, you know, at the time I was like, fuck, this is good, but it, mm -hmm. it destroyed me. So what happens as men is that we, we go through life, we have these experiences and we think, fuck, you know, I have to deal with this by myself because otherwise I'm going to appear less masculine. And we wait and we wait and we wait until it's too late and we hit fucking rock bottom. And then it's like, I need help. I need mm -hmm. to ask for help. And this is an unfortunate reality for most people that we don't seek out people that can help us until we've hit rock bottom. And until we've hit that fucking, you know, the addiction, the wife had an affair, the breakup, the loss of the job, the health crisis, whatever. And then it it's really fucking hard to get out of that sometimes. You yeah. know, it, it's really destabilizing and it can be 
Some people don't. Some people don't get out of it. They get so wrapped up in addiction or they get in such a bad place. You, you look at the prevalence of suicide among men and depression. It made me think of even just contextually, I can't remember who I heard this from, but in relationship, like women will all have one foot out the door and men won't even be aware that there's anything wrong. Yeah. And it's like, well, where, where are you? Yeah. What, what, like it, it, it's such a great example of the, just the level of detachment that men have from feeling from yeah. emotions and from re- honestly reality. They're like, yeah. well, wh- what's wrong? I'm yeah. making money. Like we got, you know, the kids are doing good school and we've got food on the table and they're just completely cut off from any deeper layer of life. And, Oftentimes what I've seen happen is when that woman leaves, those men realize that they have nothing. Yeah. Right? They have, they're, they're like, oh, this is, yeah. I got nothing. <laughs> I didn't even know yeah. that I had nothing. I didn't even know how empty I felt yeah. because I was going through the motions because I was just being a good man. Yeah. Right. And this, I mean, this can lead us onto something that I consider to be probably the most profound the most profoundly important thing in a man's life is his is the necessity for purpose because so many men they get in a relationship and suddenly the woman becomes the most important thing in his life or making enough money to to make sure that he can take care of the woman and the family and the house and the car and the fucking everything else and we unfortunately live in a society where it is you got to make money and you, you leave school and it's like, well, what are you going to do? So, uh, I don't know. Well, go to university or get a job or fucking do something because you've got to make money. And it's like, oh, okay. So then perhaps you go to university or you get a job and then you meet a girlfriend. It's, oh, you, well, you got to buy a house and you got to get married. And it's like, oh, fuck, okay. And you're doing the thing and you just, everybody else is doing the same shit and you kind of start, you're in this rat race of comparing yourself. Oh, well, they're getting married now and they're going to have a kid and they've got a house. So I've got to do that thing. And then 10, 15 years later, you're stuck in this cage of like, I never stopped to think about, is this what I really want? Mm-hmm. And you know, midlife crisis happens. And for me, think, fuck, my midlife crisis happened when I was 33, where I realized that actually I was deeply unhappy and my life sucked. But for a lot of guys, they have the kids, so they can't stop to think about it because they've got to take care of the mortgage and the kids and the family and they're just they're going through the motions when until they get to the point where the wife is like, "Well, I'm done, I'm leaving," and you're like, "Whoa, but I fuck it." There is such a critical piece of a man's life is to find his purpose, and if you don't know what it is, then that becomes your fucking purpose. Like to find out what is the thing that brings you meaning, that brings you joy. So you don't have to offload the burden of meaning onto your partner. Yeah. And she can be the most important woman in your life or the most important human in your life. But she can't be the most important thing because if you if you give her that fucking duty, which I did to my wife, and then mm-hmm. suddenly she takes it away, fucked. Not, not only that, but there's a... There's an there's an energetic happening there that as much as she wants to be valued as the most important person, more often than not, women actually don't want to be valued as the most important thing. It's a lot of pressure to put on them, right? They actually, and I did the same thing. I did the same thing in so many relationships, and I'm I'm lucky that I came across this work, you know, five or six years ago. But I still see the the tendencies in me, the nice guy tendencies to oh, like give up what I'm doing, give up my meeting, give up my purpose in order to appease my partner who oftentimes will, it will look like that's the right thing to do in the moment, but there's a deeper energetic exchange happening where it's not the right thing to do. Mm. Right? It reminds me of that entry in way, the superior man where data talks about you wouldn't be kissing your woman at the door about to go off to war to save your country. And she's like, do you really have to go? And you're like, no, 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 actually, no, I don't have to go. I'm just going to stay. Let's go to bed. Like, you know, there's some level of like, of course, in the moment she'd be excited to have you around. And there'd be a deeper part of her that would just feel totally dropped. Yeah. Right. Just a deeper part of her. That's like, but what, am I your everything? Cause it's actually. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What do you have to say on that? I've kind of lost my words there. I think there's a, a part of it is that she will lose trust in you if you drop what is most important for you in your life for her sake. And it reminds me of this. Have you ever read the book Shantaram? I have. Yep. For me, it's 
probably the greatest f- you know, fiction, non-fiction book um, that I've ever read. And I, I, I didn't read it for so long because it's a fucking monster. It's like it's 960 like pages mm-hmm. or something. But I eventually read it and I, I think I read the whole thing in five days. I couldn't put it down. Fantastic. And there's this one piece in it where the main character, he gets to India and then suddenly he falls in love. And he's like, he's never, he thought the concept of love at first sight was bullshit. And he meets this woman, the Carla, chick, for the first yeah, time. Yeah, and yeah. He's just, he's blown away by her beauty and by who she is. And then all he wants to do is fucking be with Carla. And then his mate says, hey, come and live with me and my family in my village, which is like fucking days away by train for six months. And he's like, yeah, perfect. Let's go. And I'm reading this and I'm like, whoa, (laughs) I would have never done that. I would have been like, no, fuck that. I'm going to stay with a woman. Mm -hmm. But his purpose was not to be there for a woman. His purpose, I mean, read the book if you haven't read it. I fucking couldn't recommend it any more highly. Fantastic book. His purpose was that he needed to go to this place. And because he went to this place, his entire fucking life changed because he he went with the fucking calling of his heart. And so many times in my life, I did this practice once where from zero to seven, from eight to 14, from 15 to 22, you write down all of the highlights of, of that time period of your life. And you know, once you start to get into your 20s and 30s, it, it takes a while because you remember a lot more. But then you go back over it and you pick out the things that stand out for you. And for me, including from zero to seven, you know, when I was five and six, I did things with a woman in mind. I would make decisions on about which university I was going to go to with a woman in mind. I would give up studying my master's to move to New York with my partner. Everything that I've done my entire life, I did it for a woman. And I gave away my power and I gave away my purpose. And that was one of the main reasons my life turned to shit because I'd lost that North Star. And it was just like, all right, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to give you the fucking best life ever, whatever you want to do, which is the absolute fucking opposite of what a woman wants. She wants to follow a man that knows exactly where he's going and he's happy about it and he's fucking in love with his life and he's like, that's, that's where I'm headed. And you can come or you don't have to come, but that's where I'm headed. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that fucking lights him up. It's not the I'll drop everything and follow you because then it's, you just become a burden. Absolutely. Especially when things don't work out in the way that you want them to. Yeah. You might still be in a relationship, but maybe you're not, the man's not getting his needs met because he's never actually planted his flag. Then he resents her and criticizes her and the sensitivity of women feel that so much. And then she turns off, she closes her heart. She doesn't, you know, she's not devotional. She doesn't give him love. She doesn't give him sex. And then he resents her more. Then you get habituated in this cycle. And oftentimes you'll see guys do this for five, 10, 15 years. And then the relationship collapses and they come up. It's like they're coming up for error for the first time in decades. And they, they're like, holy fuck, I just spent 15 years of my life living a life I didn't want to live. And it's no fault of hers. Mm. It's my fault. Mm. And that's where the responsibility mm. comes in. Some men won't. And then they'll get like red pilled or they'll go their own way or whatever these guys do where they're like, ah, oh, my fail- relationship failed. She left me for no reason. And I left me with, you know, I gave everything to her. It's like, yeah, but that's the problem is you gave everything from a place of neediness. Like you have to give me something back. Mm. Where a, a true provider, you know, the ma- one of the masculine gifts is that capacity for directionality, for vision and for provision given that you want nothing in return, mm. right? You're just giving for the sake of giving because you are overflowing with abundant and you know what you, abundance and you know what you want in your life. And that's all. I'm on that fucking journey too, man. It's hard. It's hard to deprogram so much of what we have learned about being nice and being fair and, and also just the, the lack of confidence that so many men have to have directionality and to stand for what they want mm. and to have that strength. And, to a lay person, you know, you and I have been in this work for a while and we've worked with dozens, if not hundreds of women who you get into a room with them and you really hear what they actually want versus what we think they want. And they'll 
resonate exactly with what we're saying. But to the lay person, they'll be like, no, that's fucking this and that. And they'll have all sorts of judgments around it. And, you know, I don't need a fucking man or I'm not going to let women tell me what to do or I don't let women control me. It's like you don't let women control you. If I looked at your life right now, like you said, how many decisions have you made in your life that were solely focused on when we start wars over women? Yeah. You know what I mean? Look at the movie 300, right? It was about a kidnapped, beautiful kidnapped woman. Right. Spartans like this is this is the history of man with all poetry and art is generally made because of women. They, they, they are immensely more powerful than us. Right. They have immensely more energetic pull and power to. To bring us into their world. And that's a beautiful thing. But it's so easy, just like the other night when we were at the party and we were all sitting together as men and, you know, that woman started dancing, right? And everyone just slowly gravitated. We're, like, having this mission focused. This is our purpose, and we're going to create this. And then someone's moving, this feminine being's moving, and we just slowly get drawn away. And they're like, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. No, we got to get back to the mission. But that's life. Mm. Like, that's life for a man on purpose is – and what I found is the bigger that life gets – and the bigger your life gets and the more directive you get, the more there is that pull mm. to get distracted into mm. like ooh, a little bit of this over here and a little bit of that. And I'm not talking about women. I'm talking about just like distraction in general, which is the feminine. It's the beauty of like, oh, but I just want to lay in the sun today. There's things to do, but like, look how beautiful it is out. Right. And that constant um, pull, which is learning how to temper our lives where we can get enough nourishment from that world, from our women, from life itself from the things that we love to do in order to drive us further towards our purpose rather than distract us and pull us mm. away from it mm. using it as fuel rather than exactly because it's a gift like let's yeah. not let's make that very clear that that energy is a gift that her her knowing is a gift everything that wants to nourish us in life is a gift from that feminine energy women and beyond but knowing where we're getting sucked into it from a place of like grasping and neediness versus using it to nourish us and help us realign so we can actually make a bigger impact. Mm. I was writing about this last night actually about this, you know, we've spent what three or four days out here in nature before that I was in Austin and there is nourishment. So take, take the idea of feminine away from just women and, and you know, feminine being nature, the great she, there is a nourishment that we need, which I castrated myself off mm -hmm. from most of my life. I'd get it from women. I'd get these little fucking dabs of validation of like, oh, that feels good. Oh, that feels nice. But I wouldn't go spend time in nature, whereas either just me or just a couple of dudes or... And then suddenly you do that. And it's like... You know, you put a frog in, in water and then you turn up the heat and it will just fucking stay there until the water's boiling and it, and it dies. That's what it was for me because I didn't realize how badly I needed nature. And now it's become non-negotiable. Like now it's like, hey, man, come hang up, hang out in the Pacific Northwest. I'm like, dude, let's do it. You know, I'll cancel fucking other plans just to come out <laughs> and sit in a treehouse on the water and... I could create and talk about shit and life and and it's something that nourishes us to a it's, it's a that you cannot get anywhere else and it's almost like we we seek the fucking scraps from the table of like totally. oh I'm gonna get validation from this woman and it's like okay cool that might feel good for a second but what if you just went out and hung out with nature with a couple of dudes like went camping. And just fucking, or even by yourself, go out and just read a book, just lie under the trees and fucking just be by yourself. That is going to feel a thousand times better than some chick fucking liking a photo or giving you some kind of validation somewhere else. And that's, that's one of the most, it's not, I mean, I, I guess it's something that I only started to really understand when we'd go out into the desert with John and all of these other men and when we'd go into nature with all these other men and and it took me a while to kind of break through the density of my incapacity to feel and once that density started to dissolve and break up and then suddenly 
you know, the first time I've been to Peru man, fucking six or seven times mm. and there was one moment that I went straight after a time we were in the desert. I guess there was like 45 of us in the desert this year and John was talking about become as wide as the desert. I'm like, become as wide as the desert? What the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> and we sit there and he's dropping us into this meditation and suddenly my, you know, my awareness goes from here to like... I was like, holy shit, man. Like, this is incredible. And then I went back to the Sacred Valley to run a retreat. And I got the taxi driver to stop on that road that goes down where you start to see the Apus, the mountains, for mm-hmm. the first time. And I stood there and it's like, it's become as wide as the mountains. And I breathed her in. And I fucking started weeping. It was like, I've never felt this before. I've been here so many times. I've never actually experienced being nourished by the great she like I have now. Yeah. And you know, something about that when we can, when we have the capacity to get filled by the great she and nature and beauty and art that we take the burden off of our partners or mm. off of women to fill mm. that. And then we can love them from such a deeper place yeah. because we can appreciate them like art. We can appreciate them. Uh, we can weep at like we wept uh, at the mountains. And it's funny that you mentioned the sacred valley because years ago I, I learned this practice to kind of feel into the part of me that's always free. You know when I'm feeling burdened, like okay, and and the and we had to bring an image that came to mind. And the image that came to mind of like my freedom place was the sacred valley. Like I was up on the mountain, and I was just looking over the valley. Right. So same thing. Like when we can get nourished by the mundane, as many people see it, like, oh, it's just another tree, it's just the forest, it's just the ocean, then our capacity to be nourished by our woman who's full of energy and full of life and full of all of this is so much bigger, so much grander. And that comes into our sex and that comes into our relationship where we're not coming from, we're already full. Like we don't need our Mm -hmm. cup filled Mm -hmm. up, Mm -hmm. right? And so, so many men, they seek that validation because they're trying to get filled up by the feminine as woman rather than understanding that the feminine is everything that isn't us, essentially. Everything that's not the stillness, everything that's moving, that has life force energy is the feminine and has the capacity to nourish us in the same way that a woman does. We just have such big blinders on. We have such tunnel vision that we can't see it any other way. Mm -hmm. We think the only way that I can get satisfied is by getting attention, love, adoration, touch, validation, whatever it is from woman. And that's just, it's the same thing. And then we give up our purpose and we give up our lives to seek that endlessly. When the truth is when we come nourished first by stepping into our purpose, by taking time to get, to sit under that tree and read a book, to lay in the grass, to to, to feel the sun and, and use that energy towards our purpose. We're already so full that we don't need validation from women, but ironically, we become so magnetic because it's so rare to see a man that's so full of life, Mm. right? And directional and focused and on purpose that we just magnetize that energy anyway, Mm. right? And so many guys got this backwards. And like I said, for me, like I'm still unlocking this and reminding myself and learning this. And I was talking with Alan last week on this podcast about the days that I spent, you know, that 28 day backcountry trip and My solo days, I spent six days alone, just built a fire, built a little shelter. And the level of nourishment, I was literally laying on the ground doing nothing, like laughing, like just bliss the fuck out because I'm watching the squirrels run by and I'm watching the pines dance in the wind and I'm just fucking just like, oh, like just loving it, man. And there was nobody there. There was nobody to talk to and there was nothing to do. I didn't know what time it was. I didn't know anything. It didn't matter. Because I had opened myself to receive her and she just wanted to wash me with nourishment. Mm-hmm. You know, and I came home so fucking full for, my, for Jen, right? I came home so full, so slow and just so like, wow, I can just see you for exactly as you are without needing anything because I'm full. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is also one of the excuses I guess is the right word where men, are like, oh, I don't have time. It, it's not a priority. I, you know, I got to take care of the family and I got work. And it's like, it's like people that say they don't have time for meditation. Mm-hmm. Meditation gives you time. Like it creates space. And if you come hang out in nature by yourself or with mates, 
you come back to your partner and to your family so much greater than you would if you didn't do that. You, they feel you so much more deeply and you become a better man. And this whole excuse of like, ah, I don't have time, it's like, well, fucking make time. If you want to show up for your family the best man you possibly could, then make the time. Yeah, it's not by doing more for them because mm. that's what you've already been doing and that's the treadmill guys get stuck on. It's like, well, if I just do more, but then you don't get the response you want, the resentment builds, we get back into that loop, right? It's oftentimes the opposite thing of what we think. It's like, no, 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 no. you got to take more time to get nourished other ways, mm. right? So you can come back mm. more full. And as you said, when you, when you receive the nourishment from the great she, you don't go back to your partner trying to fucking take nourishment from her in ways that she might not be able to give you. Exactly. And then you resent her because she can't give you a certain type of nourishment. It's like, well, fucking get her somewhere else that is infinite. Mm-hmm. And men, many men think that getting it somewhere else means a different texture of woman or a different yeah. woman. And that's where it fair. Oh, she doesn't have. Yeah, she's not. She, she is all and everything, but first you have to understand that like you need to develop the energetic capacity to be with all and everything for even for her to even gift that to you. And a great way to practice that is obviously not with other women because that's not going to work out for 99% of relationships. But instead of finding that nourishment where you can really come back and see her for everything that she is. Let's do a time check because I want to make sure that we're not running over time. I know you're on a schedule here. Oh, yeah. Should probably wrap things up. Um, um, whatever, man. We all good? Yeah. I need to piss, but um, <laughs> I can miss this other thing. How was your piss? It was awkward because the railing was kind of not high enough that I could piss under and not low enough that I could piss <laughs> over. <laughs> so we've been talking about, you know, rites of passage, initiation, and we kind of got on a tangent around purpose. And I, re- I really see how all of this... It kind of flows together, but I'm just curious if there's anything else about rites of passage that you you want to share as we we begin to wind down and, and uh, yeah, yeah. I think um, one thing that was really apparent for me after I'd started this journey of kind of working out how to become a man and how I can get initiated and rites of passage and things was this relationship that I'd had with my father, which had not really changed from being a child and a teenager to an adult, he would still treat me as if I was a child, despite having gone through all these things myself. And I was with um, a man called Dr. Arnie Rubenstein, who's this Australian um, rites of passage facilitator. And he has something called the Rite of Passage Institute in Byron Bay. And he's put a quarter of a million people around the world through rites of passage. He's reintroduced rites of passage into Aboriginal communities in Australia. An amazing guy. And I was doing a training with him and he speaks about the the format of every rite of passage has the separation, the ordeal, and then the integration. But one of the things that really stuck out for me was this idea that the parents themselves have to go through in a, through a rite of passage at the same time. Because if the parents are where they're at, the, the boy or the girl, whoever is where they're at, and then the boy or the girl goes through a rite of passage. If the parents don't do their own, they'll continually see the child as the child. Mm. So it's critical that they actually do some kind of rite of passage themselves where they can then see that the child has actually gone through this process. So a few years ago, 10 years ago now, I was... I was uh, hiking through Nepal with my family and I had a bunch of mushrooms with me. And my dad's a very conservative guy and he was 60 at the time, never done any kind of drugs, never, you know, he'd drink a lot. But for him, anything other than alcohol was just kind of A-grade narcotics that would see you in prison and put you in hospital. And Sounds like my dad. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just this, the, the, it's a really successful fear campaign, which thank fuck has started to change. And now all the, the research is coming out saying how magical these things actually are. And so long story short, we ended up having this experience where I fed him a bunch of mushrooms and kind of 
you know, his 60-year-old box that he'd been living in his entire life just dissolved into nothingness and he saw for the first time the capacity of life outside of his belief system. And it changed everything for us. It completely changed our connection, father and son, to, yes, he's still my father, yes, I'm still his son, but now suddenly we're men and suddenly we're friends and suddenly it was just... It was the most, it was one of the most miraculous things that I'd ever kind of experienced in my life. And what I realized after was that that was his rite of passage. You know, we had been separated from society. So he was where nobody else in the world knew him. So he could, he felt safe enough to do something that perhaps he never would. He went through this ordeal, which was to have his mind blown open in ways that he'd never experienced. And then the the integration was us talking about what had happened and us starting to have conversations about our relationship and about his relationship with his father and one of the one of the ways that an ordeal is created for rites of passage is that you enter the ecstasis which creates liminal space and in that liminal space certain things your, your belief systems change. So ecstasis can, can be anything from you know, an ice bath to dancing to music to sex to, to whatever experience that is going to create this liminal space within your, within your mind, which is going to allow very solidified belief systems to dissolve. Mm. And that was exactly what happened for him. And suddenly he went from seeing me as, this, as his son and as his boy to holy shit, this guy's actually a man and we have more in common than I thought. And and it was just this incredibly profound experience for many, many reasons. And it really, once it, you know, Dr. Arnie Rubenstein was explaining to me the process of how these things work, that was when the penny dropped. And it's like, okay, so that's why that happened. Because now suddenly I had taken my father through a rite of passage changed his life, changed our life, changed the relationship and ultimately the dynamic of the entire family. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, we oftentimes think of the downward effect of initiations and rites of passage in terms of like our children and our children's children and oftentimes people don't always consider going upstream, mm. right? And, and kind of healing the relationships if we're fortunate enough to still have our parents around and have the consciousness and awareness and they have the openness to it. Of, of beginning to feel, heal the lineage up because that has such a huge impact on how we father our children. Well, right, this is the other, the other piece of this is so many of my clients and friends and it's like, oh, you know, I can't have these conversations with my parents. Like they're not ready for it. And the power of healing the father wound, especially for men, like it's, it's second to none. It's like... If you can't at least attempt to heal that, you're just going to pass that down to your yeah. down the lineage. And so many people I know, I like, know oh, I can't have that conversation. They're not ready. And it's like, well, let's look at that from a different angle for a second. They were born in a generation. Most parents, the age of our parents, were born in a generation directly affected by war because their parents were in the war whether they were in it like directly or whether they were related to people that were in it, they were worldwide affected by Second World War. And then you have the Vietnam War and you have all of these things. They didn't have access to any form of healing. So our parents, you know, born directly from a generation that were directly affected by war, all of the trauma that comes with that. Our parents then have us who exists at a time where there are a thousand and one healing modalities on every fucking street corner mm -hmm. from free to expensive to whatever it is that you want. There is every possibility to heal. We are fortunate enough to have the tools and the know-how and the understanding to have these conversations with our parents. And in most instances, what I've found, what my clients have found is that the parent actually wants this. They just don't have the tools to know how to do it. They don't have the tools to start these conversations. They don't have the 
you know, most parents aren't going to be like, hey, you know, I was thinking about doing mushrooms for the first time. What do you think? And then the kids are like, well, no, my parents aren't into that because, you know, they're too conservative. And suddenly you have you know, father and son, for example, that are just not willing to take that step because neither of them have the courage to actually just put it out there. Put it out there. Yeah. And then it's it's my belief that it's up to us as the generation who has all of this healing around us to actually just stake in the ground and say, hey, mate, what do you think about this? These are the side effects. These are the possibilities. These are how fucking beautiful it can be. Here's the scientific evidence now. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. When, I remember I when I first started drinking ayahuasca back in 2015, I was very vocal about it with my family and like I didn't I didn't felt like I had anything to hide and um, same kind of thing my parents had a conservative more or less background around drug use and things like that and I was just share openly about how profoundly it was impacting my life and same with Vipassana meditation right I just started meditating and then I would come home and I would share about it but what was even more miraculous was I was I was different. I was changing. I was softer. I was kinder to my parents. I had more interest in them. I, I, I was different around them and they were really impacted by it. They're like, whoa, so what's going on? Right. And they got curious. And so I didn't even need to make the invitation necessarily mm. because just my way of being had shifted so miraculously, miraculously that they wanted some of that. Everyone in my family, after I came home from Bapashta, I talked to my brother about it. He could feel the change in me and he went and sat one, loved it. Then he sat another one, loved it, right? And so he started meditating. And then my stepdad started, he didn't go to Vipassana, but he started looking into it. And then he started doing insight meditation at home and he got a meditation teacher. And it's so, you know, it's a common kind of uh, phrase stated that, you know, when we heal ourselves, we, we, we're healing for everyone. But... Oftentimes, if we're really taking on our work and we're really sincere, just our beingness enough will open the doors to curiosity within our family and they'll start looking at us a little differently and then they'll start asking a few questions, you know, and say, oh, how did you do this? And, and if we're willing to, to have those vulnerable and authentic conversations with them, the gift we can provide them through that. And then, it, like you said, it ends up coming back to us as well, just with a deeper relationship uh, it's so profound. And what I noticed as I get older, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, is we kind of did this switch. We're like, we're kind of teaching our parents now, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. God, I, I hope that everybody gets to have that experience, not because I want to teach my parents, but because it's showing, like you said, it's like we're evolving into places that they never got the opportunity to evolve into. Mm -hmm. You know, we have access to things. We have the technologies and the conversations and the internet and all this kind of stuff that didn't exist when they were growing up to start to unpack these wounds and unpack these lineages, these things in the lineage that they inherited that oftentimes isn't like, it's no fault of their own. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and just that, what a gift. Right, what a gift to 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 give our family, to give to the people that raised us. Right, it's like, you know, this is a whole other conversation. But the idea that we kind of go through life and then we end up having to take care of our parents and change their diapers, and then we get sick of it, and we put them in a home, and they kind of rot there, which is what Western culture does, right? But instead, actually being a catalyst for change in our family, right? And I think that's we all have that opportunity to not make our healing only all about ourselves, but actually when we are in the work and we're we're wearing it on our sleeve and we're talking about it openly and we're sharing authentically and being willing to have those vulnerable conversations with the people that we love and that are close to us sometimes that's enough for them to really take take a plunge you mm. know take a step forward in their own healing yeah i love that it's it's very much a case of the transmission that you're emitting mm -hmm. based on the work that you've done which becomes the you know, the, the banner, the fucking, the bright and shiny, like, look at this, this is the work, rather than just talking about it, mm -hmm. actually, what is the energy that you transmit from the work that you've done? Absolutely. Just one final piece on that. As you said, in the West, it's kind of once people get older, we kind of like start to put them into homes, then forget about them. And this is one of the really, it's one of the real tragedies of the culture that we live in because for so many traditions, and there isn't just one rite of passage from 
boyhood to manhood or from girlhood to womanhood, we have many across our lives, you know, graduation and marriage and all of these things. One of the most beautiful is when you become an elder, when you go from just like a an older person of of, um, of society into actually becoming an elder. And there is a, there's a Native American tradition where they would cut off they were long white hair that for the ponytail and they'd hang it up over the tipi. And these guys would no longer go hunt. They would no longer go to war. But they'd actually sit around the fire and they'd be the ones, the, the wisdom keepers, they'd be the ones that would tell stories that people would come to for advice. And we've lost that. True eldership, yeah. And we now, as you said, we put older people in the home and you said we live in a society where people are fucking spending thousands of dollars to try and make themselves look younger because they fear getting older because they fear what's going to happen to them rather than fully embracing it and being seen as a wisdom keeper and as an elder and somebody who just was demands respect because of the life that they've lived we live in a society it's just like oh, no, fuck, we don't want to get old so we'll just put them over there so we don't have to think about them and that is a real tragedy in life and it's, something that's um, it's fucking awful. detrimental. Yeah, and you know, and there's a there's a whole other conversation. Like just because you're old doesn't mean you're an elder. And that's the mm. unfortunate reality too, is is that it's everybody deserves respect, but there's often this idea that I'm an elder because I've aged, which is totally a misnomer you know yeah. eldership comes through wisdom yeah. and and through living life and, and confronting life and going through initiations instead of avoiding them and avoiding getting old and then before you know it you're old uh, so yeah i mean that's a whole other topic for a, a, another conversation but i do want to start to wrap things up for us um but before we go just uh just let people know who whoever's watching this or, or listening to this kind of where they could find you how they can connect with you uh anything that you're offering and uh yeah, man. I've uh, my life is now a a bevy of different retreats and workshops and coaching and um, Instagram at Nick Warner or my website nickwarner.com normally has everything that's up to date. But there's retreats for just men, retreats for couples. Uh, pretty soon, there's going to be retreats for couples with plant medicine. Um, just reach out and hit me up and. Uh, towards the end of the year, they'll have an online program that's up and going as well. And yeah, cool, it's, man. It's uh, on the up and up. Well, it's been great hanging out in the treehouse with you and doing this again. And uh, yeah, just there's always more. There's always more to talk about. I feel like we could just do this for eight to 10 hours, but uh, <laughs> let's leave it at this for now. And uh, yeah, we'll do it again soon. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks for having me.